All right, ladies and gentlemen, uh, our next presentation is from Wayne Hansen from the University of New Brunswick in St. John. It is called Digital Technology in a Changing Folk Music Media Scape. So I'll turn it over to Wayne. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you so much. It's uh, wonderful to be in Cape Breton, and uh, I'm going to try and give uh, a very non-academic type, um, no academic rigor to my presentation at all, which uh, sadly, here's my abstract, which is very big, uh, and I just want to read a couple of things off the abstract that will kind of guide us in our, in our direction here. Um, so this creative presentation will explore dimensions of one artist being me. Uh, in establishing a presence on the regional folk music scene. Uh, the modern mediascape and the live folk music performance have been uh, transformed, I would argue, by the prevalence of digital technology. And what I want to show you today, uh, I'm not going to read the rest of this because that's super boring. I'm going to show pictures and I'm going to sing songs. Um, yeah, there's too much text on my page. So our discussion today, what I want to talk about is how affordable digital tools and Web 2.0 technologies have enabled uh, me and other artists like me to showcase in the digital age. Um, so that's one aspect of it. And then I'm going to turn a corner. And what I want to show you is that um, not only does it affect the way we market and promote and create content, uh, I want to show you how it affects uh, my show in particular and how digital technology is transforming uh, folk music, uh, Canadian folk music. Um, so this is me holding my ukulele, which, uh, so I do this really fun thing where I loop my ukulele and my guitar at the same time, and it's really cool, and I was going to do that for you today, and then uh, my ukulele broke. Uh, oh. Isn't that sad? Yes. The, yes the, the, so I'm also a stand-up comedian, so we want to do some jokes that I'm with that, too. Um, so yeah, I have a CD release show, I have two of them planned for next week, and my ukulele broke, so I'm really stressed out about it, but it won't affect today's presentation, I promise. <laughs> Um, so I have an electronic engineering uh, technology background, uh, BA in information and communication studies, uh, and I, I did a master's degree in interdisciplinary studies. And I'm really interested in um, the merger of technology and culture and how that all comes together. And today I'm going to talk, uh, so my master's work was on uh, uh, technology and, and knowledge economies and those sorts of things. Um, and today I want to talk particularly about music and, and technology. Um, and in my day job, uh, I work at UMB uh, in a support role. I also teach in, uh, in the Faculty of Arts. Um, so I would argue that, and many have, that the low cost of digital technologies and prolifer proliferation of digital networks has allowed artists of all types to, uh, to showcase. And, and in particular, I think of Justin Bieber and those types of folks that go on YouTube and they get their stuff seen and they become superstars. That's not what I'm going for. Um, in this new web, everyone can create content and share it. And I think that's absolutely true. And uh, I think the, the challenge for artists these days is that if everyone can showcase, how do you showcase? Um, and I'll talk a little bit about that as we go on. Um, I'm going to start with, um, I usually look at the screen when I do this, and I can't see the screen, so you'll see me pointing to nothing. Um, I'll talk about self-producing a little bit, and, and I certainly am open to like a two-way conversation, so if anybody wants to ask me questions as we go through, uh, I'm totally fine with this. I'm going to be done in half an hour, so get your questions in quickly. Um, so in April of 2012, I produced an album called Memories of East Africa. Um, I produced it in my basement on uh, cheap tools, but it sounded really good, I think. Um, and just this October, I produced, uh, or finished producing, uh, my second album called Escape, and I'll tell you a bit about those and uh, why I think they're interesting. Um, this is my recording studio, and, and the reason that, so the, the screen is divided into two halves. The top half is a, a really crappy picture of my studio, and uh, for those of you that are interested in, in, in recording, you'll know that there's nothing correct about this studio. Everything's wrong about it. It's a square room, for instance. Um, it's a ceramic tile floor, which none of these things lend itself to recording well. Um, and there's just nothing good about it. The drums are in the same room as my vocal mics. Uh, nothing should work about this. Uh, and the bottom half of the screen, I show two, uh, two iMacs. Uh, one of them is actually one of the ones I have. Um, the, the mixer on the right hand side of the screen is a performance mixer, not a recording mixer. And uh, I, I don't know if anyone cares about this, but there is an important point in here. Uh, in the middle um, is a condenser microphone, and it's actually a pretty low end condenser microphone. It's worth about 150 bucks. Um, so nothing about this setup is good. It's all very cheap gear. 
Um, but if you're meticulous, even with cheap gear, you can now produce things that sound half decent. Um, so my, re my process is I, I record in that crappy studio and then I work with a company out of Toronto called Indie Pool to produce my, my records. Um, and the results, I would argue, are low cost but high quality. And I think that's where we're at with, with technology. Um, so that's one kind of portion of it. I'm going to try to wrap this up about 11.30 and then I'm going to switch over and, and perform two songs for you. Um, so uh, Beers 2006 said uh, Web 2.0. Um, and for, for those of you out there maybe not familiar with uh, 2.0 technologies, it's the, uh, the read-write web. So the idea that we can put information on the web, but we can also receive information and we have conversations on, uh, on the internet. Um, and it's transforming music culture. Uh, and I draw a lot, a lot on uh, Jenkins' idea of participatory culture, that, um, and with these five keys to participatory, the participatory culture, low barriers to artistic, artistic expression, uh, support, so there's an informal support network out there, uh, and a, a type of mentorship that occurs. I want to show you uh, how these types of things have affected me. Uh, members believe that their contributions matter. Um, I, I, I'm not sure about that yet. We're, figuring that out as we go along, and uh, the social connections that, uh, that we're creating. Um, so showcasing in the digital age, everyone goes to YouTube, and YouTube's a great site for getting your stuff up there and, and actively participating in online communities. And that's certainly one of the first things I did, is get my stuff up on YouTube. And um, for young people these days, that's the first place they're going to find new music. Uh, so when I do a show at a club, um, the, the next day I look at my YouTube hits, that's my narcissism, um, but I look at my YouTube hits and you see that's where folks are going to find out more about you. Um, and the reason I chose this clip is if, if you can read that up there, I'm not sure how clear it is, but you can see it says my CBC search by 2013 entry. So I'm going to talk about that as we go along with CBC and how important that is. Um, so there's lots of places though, besides YouTube, that you can showcase in this digital age. Um, I don't know who, who's familiar. Anyone familiar with Bandcamp? Yeah? Okay, so a few folks. So Bandcamp is essentially uh, a site uh, where you can uh, put your albums up, uh, you can put your uh, PayPal information in, and people can buy your albums off Bandcamp, or you can give them away for free. As long as you're not um, covering other people's material, you can put your stuff up there and people can find it. And it's a really great site, and, and there's a whole uh, community aspect built in as well, so that uh, I can connect with other musicians, they can connect with me, so that's always fun. Uh, MySpace, hey, MySpace is still around, believe it or not, and uh, this is, um, uh, so yeah, it just got bought, and it's, it's gone through all these transformations. Uh, I talk about MySpace in uh, one of my digital living classes, and I ask my students, hey, who here is using iSpace, or MySpace, and they say, what is MySpace? <laughs> And I try to explain to them that they were the Facebook before Facebook was Facebook. And uh, so when we think Facebook might never go away, well, uh, MySpace is a good example. Um, but it, so, and the reason I bring it up is that because now it's a place for artists to share music. And, and I'm not sure quite how successful that's been, but that's what's happening. Uh, Reverb Nation, uh, much the same. Reverb Nation is kind of cool because people can throw their albums up and then um, it'll rank you. So uh, if you. <laughs> So the trick about Reverb Nation, I think, is to find the most niche market you can find. And then next you'll be number one on the east coast of Canada for uh, you know, African folk music or something. Um, and when I talk to my students, I often bring up the, uh, you know, the idea of independent radio and how important that is these days. And I think that's really showcasing in the, in the digital age because um, most uh, independent and local radio stations broadcast th through the web now and you can pick up that free stream and all of a sudden you have a worldwide reach if you're getting airplay on your local campus and community station. I think that's so super important and uh, trying to tell my other musician friends that is uh, agonizing and painful but I think my message is getting through. Uh, so is the CD dead? Well clearly not, not to me and, and not to most of my artist friends uh, because when you go to a show uh, trying to get someone to <laughs> When they say, hey, do you have music for sale? And you say, yeah, sure, go home and download it on iTunes. It doesn't work that way. They want something in their hands at a show. Uh, so is the CD dead? No, it's not dead. I have a couple that I want to hand out uh, here to pass around. Um, because one of the things I didn't mention uh, when I talked about low cost, um, you know, a generic term of low cost. What is low cost? Well, my first album, Memories of East Africa, I paid to have it mastered, um, and the total was about, for the first hundred copies, it was about 900 to to $1,000, somewhere around there, which is super cheap, right? 
Um, and my second album, because I learned a lot from doing the first one, I was able to produce it and have the first 100 copies shipped to my door for about $480, so $4.80 a CD. For the first 100, that cost will go down. Um, so is the CD dead? No, not, not to me, not to most of the, my musician friends. Um, and of course, iTunes. So the, the other really cool thing now is that uh, I, we can get iTunes, we can get our material up on iTunes for free, right? Uh, what happens is your, uh, your liaison, like Indie Pool or somebody, will take 10% uh, off the top. And I tried to tell them 10% of nothing is still nothing, but... Uh, <laughs> um, so you can get on iTunes for free. So it's very, very easy to reach a broad audience. Um, but what does that mean? Who cares if you're reaching a whole audience if nobody can find you? And uh, so I'll talk a little bit about flickering connections before I move into my next stage. Uh, so this idea of flickering connections that uh, through social media, Web 2.0, YouTube, all these sorts of things that we're connecting with other musicians, we're connecting with uh, fans, uh, and we're connecting with institutions, um, I think is super important. So I, I have two pictures up on this page. On the right hand side of the screen is um, uh, a writer, Nelson Hansen, no relation, I promise. Uh, <laughs> it's spelled the same way and everything, but he's not, not a relation. And on the left hand side, I have the Twitter icon. Uh, so I do a lot of tweeting about uh, the things that I do and, and the places I'm touring. And uh, this article was the first article that was written about uh, my music. Um, and uh, so KV Folky is into creative looping. If that's not an article title that will grab your attention, I don't know what it is. Um, so this idea of flickering connections, the idea that uh, the, the online world can translate into the real world, and, and those lines are getting really blurred, but uh, for me this was really important to get some real, um, some real press about what I was doing, and it wouldn't have happened without the flickering connections made through uh, Web 2.0. Um, and secondly, the, so the guy up on the screen, does anyone know this guy, Pat LaPorteville? Okay, if you have a chance to see Pat, he's, he's uh, I, always, I think he's a genius, he's a wonderful uh, presenter, creator, uh, musician, and so an interesting thing happened, Pat's toured extensively across the country and through the states, uh, I was just getting started in my uh, career as a musician, um, and I covered some of Pat's material up on my YouTube site, and um, so one day I'm at home and I get a call from Toronto, and it's, and it's Pat, and um, he's, he's like much younger than me, but I was still super nervous. I got the phone call and, and he said, hey, I'm coming through New Brunswick, let's do a show together. And I thought, okay, that, that's where it's happening. So it's happening through social media, is creating these real opportunities in real life. And uh, we did a show together, um, and, and I don't have a lot of time, but the funny thing was, uh, I covered his material in my opening set. So that's really funny, because I kind of left him scrambling for songs. Um, <laughs> Um, so that was a lot of fun. Anyway, uh, but I do see that's how these flickering connections are working. Um, and so I, I do want to talk a little bit about CBC Searchlight, and then I'm going to go pick up my guitar. Um, so CBC Searchlight is this idea, uh, I don't know who's familiar with it and who isn't familiar with it, but uh, essentially uh, every year CBC runs a Searchlight competition where you can basically throw up a song up to the CBC site, and they have this elimination thing where you... Uh, pester all of your friends and family, anyone who's ever heard of you even remotely, you pester them to go online and vote for you. And you say, every day you have to vote, and you, and you, you, know, you, you push yourself out there that way. And it's, uh, it's this horrible experience in that way. But what it's really great for is that the CBC um, will broadcast your stuff. So all of a sudden, you're, you're this guy recording in your basement, and now the CBC is, is playing your music, and you're connecting with other artists. And it's, and it's typically all done online, and then somebody wins at the end and they win a lot of money. Um, but I, I don't really see that as the important part. What I see is really important is that um, you're connecting with folks, you're making these flickering connections all through social media. It's not that hard. And, um, and what has come out of that for me? So I was a, a regional finalist. I'm in New Brunswick, so being a regional finalist isn't as grand as it might sound. But because uh, a lot of my friends were also regional finalists. but. Um, 
Um, but it was great, and, and it really started to showcase my music. And then our, our uh, provincial uh, CBC uh, show picked up my music, and now I'm, I'm regu regularly played on the CBC. Uh, so this is a couple of days ago at my local uh, CBC Radio 1 affiliate. Um, I'm getting my picture taken with uh, the local host. And essentially now, uh, because of the power of social media, uh, I have a great working relationship with these folks. So essentially, if I need something done, I call them up and I say, hey, can I stop in the studio and, and bring, bring some music to you? And that's how it's changed. So democratization, absolutely. Um, out of this article I was working with, can anyone talented enough can chart and the consumer is now setting the musical agenda? No way, I don't think that's true at all. But is there is there an element of that? Yeah, absolutely. And, and for local regional musicians, uh, these tools are just super incredible to get your music out there. Um, wow, I, I did it on time. So I have about 15 minutes left. Now what, what I want to show you is, so we talked about all these tools that are out there to promote myself and create the material. Uh, I want to show you um, how I think uh, looping technology, L-O-O-P, um, uh, is, has changed the, uh, the um, folk music performance, and I'm looking for my guitar pick. Um, so, for those of you not familiar with looping, it's essentially uh, laying down, it's, it's, it's multi-track recording done live, and uh, I have a really fun time with it. And you see it done a lot with um, like hip-hop artists and, and beatboxers and those sorts of things. I'm going to show you right now how to do it with an acoustic guitar. I'm gonna layer some, some guitar and vocals and, uh, and I hope you enjoy it. We'll see if all my levels are set correctly. So I have, um, I have two songs that I wanna play for you. Uh, the first one is essentially, uh, it's called Fine Line and it's, off my uh, newest album and uh, the reason I chose to start with this one is that I do a lot of layers with it and it'll give you a good idea of the kind of thing I'm trying to do. The, the uh, second song that I'll do for you is uh, it's called uh, Zanzibar. It's called Zanzibar and it's uh, it's off the first album that I was talking about, Memories of East Africa. So uh, this is called Fine Line. I hope it doesn't get too loud. Uh, you're all encouraged to sing along with me which will be super fun. That sound okay so far? Yeah, it's not too loud? I'm used to playing in bars where people are drinking more.
starts off really, really well, and I can hear myself really great, and everything goes fine. Um, but if they stick around long enough, uh, I will mess up, and it will go horribly wrong, and, but it's all fun. So this song, um, this song's called Zanzibar, and, um, and this kind of fits into our whole theme of uh, storytelling. Um, so I, I backpacked through uh, Kenya and Tanzania a couple years ago, and uh, I wrote an album about it called Memories of East Africa. And uh, this song is about the uh, the time I spent three days wandering around Stonetown, Zanzibar. Has anyone been to Zanzibar? Excellent. I can make things up. You won't know. Um, so uh, this song is called Zanzibar, and I'm going to tell you. Um, I'm, I'll make sure I finish a quarter out, a quarter two. Um, a quarter two is that right? Okay. So I tell this really long story, and sometimes this song goes on for about 20 minutes. Um, I'll do it in six. Uh, it feels like I need that tune. I can do that song in six minutes. So Zanzibar, here we go.
Cruz of Stonetown, Zanzibar. And I met a guy named Ari Rubenstein, and Ari said he was from New York City. When I got home, I thought, that story wasn't true at all. Ari was not from New York City. But anyway, we spent a couple days wandering around together and exploring Stonetown. And um, so an interesting thing happened. I'll tell you about that in the second verse. The first verse just talks about uh, being in Zanzibar, the hot weather, or the sun coming up over the village. And this is the song I played for the CBC Searchlight Competition. It got me in the regional finals. I can't help but think if the song was just a little bit better, I would be the new Brunswick finals.
Thank you so much.